A man on his job can't afford tender emotions. Well, that's what I feel. He feels them, but he has to quell them. Yes. On the other hand, Philip Marlowe feels them and, and, and speaks about them. He makes yeah, he's about always confused. He is, isn't he? <laughs> he's like me. Hello folks, and welcome back to Ear Read This. My name's Ash, and today I'm talking about the life of Raymond Chandler. Now, a few months ago, Adam and I finally got round to talking about The Big Sleep, something we'd been discussing for a very long time. Since then, over on the Patreon page, we've been going through Chandler's novels chronologically, and we've just got up to Lady in the Lake, which we recorded the other night. But for today, I'm going to be talking about the life of the writer himself. And to do so, I'm delighted to be joined by a very special guest, Tom Williams is the author of A Mysterious Something in the Light, his biography of Raymond Chandler, which came out in 2012. It's a terrific biography, full of surprises about Raymond Chandler, and to hear more about it, tune in tomorrow, as I'll be posting an extended interview with Tom, in which I ask him more about the writing process of his book, where it all started, and what it was that first interested him about Raymond Chandler. So a huge thank you to Tom uh, for coming on the podcast do yourself a favour and get yourself a copy of the book. There is a link in the episode description box below. And that's about all from me. I'm going to hand over to Tom. There is just one small piece of information I need to give you for today's episode to make sense. Raymond Chandler's cat was called Tacky. It'll make sense when you hear it. Thank you once again to Tom, and I hope you enjoy the episode. So first of all, one thing that um, made me laugh a lot, just just in the pictures in your book was <laughs> just the uh, the I, when I think of Chandler I think of 1930s LA early Hollywood mm. and the first picture in your book um is what of what looks like someone's Victorian daughter and it it <laughs> says a lot about the he seems to span so many different worlds um yeah could we start off with talking a bit about his 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 childhood sure John did as you say spend so many different worlds i mean on the on the one hand he he kind of you know stood astride britain and america but he also stood astride multiple uh, uh kind of historical periods he he was born into a victorian family and a proper Vic, victorian family his mother uh ran away to america mm-hmm. um and met uh Chandler's father morris in the United States, in in in, in, um, in Nebraska, and fell in love, maybe fell in love. Uh, it isn't actually clear, but they had mm. they had Chandler, um, they had Raymond in in Chicago in 1888. The marriage fell apart pretty quickly. I and mean, um, Morris Chandler was working on the railways and was away a lot. He was also a very violent drunk. And one thing that Chandler seems to have witnessed as a young boy growing up in Chicago is his father uh, beating his mother Florence and that um, was as you might imagine very traumatic for him and he felt I assume I I don't know he doesn't ever talk about this himself this is a story he told someone later Um, but he he must he must have felt very useless uh, as as a sort of young boy and but the marriage falls apart and Chandler's mother, Florence, takes Ray to live, first of all, in Ireland and later in London. And this is where the Victorian family really comes up, because you know, Chicago in, in the late 19th century was, was the centre of the world. It was, had, it was the Chicago World's Fair where you first saw the, the, I think it was the Edison light bulb, you first saw the Ferris wheel, it was where you know, the future was happening now. <laughs> and, and not that Raymond Chandler would necessarily have, have, have been aware of all of that, but he went from that to this austere Victorian household, mm. Quaker household, um, very disapproving of, 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 of Florence's experience. And divor- you know, the fact that she was a divorcee was, was, was really looked down upon in the family. And, and, and Chandler, as the product of this, this unhappy marriage, was somewhat looked down upon as well. Um, so, so he he had this oddly uh, modern early childhood, followed by a very Victorian uh, period, uh, and then moving to Dulwich was 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 more Victorian still. I mean, Dulwich is a, I don't know if you've you've ever been to the the school there, 
no. beautiful building in the middle of the field in, in, in what was the kind of village. And it instilled a very old fashioned sense of chivalry and a set of values that really belong to the late 19th century, early Georgian mm. period that were really kind of, you know, undermined in 1914 by the war. And, and by that, I mean, you know, all of these, these, these chivalric notions were instilled into a lot of public schoolboys, um, but very much at Dulwich as well. There's some um, interesting kind of comments about, you know, seeing the, the ways in which they were kind of um, told to value honour, the way mm. that they were told to value personal sacrifice as well. Mm. Um, and all of that kind of gets instilled in Dulwich. And for an entire generation, not just Dulwich, I mean, it, this was happening at public schools across, across the UK. Mm. But for Marlowe and for Chandler, you, you can see, you can begin to see the thread that was established maybe back in, uh, in, in Chicago as his father beat his mother and then you know, was given a set of values um, at a school that later emerge in Marlowe as the, the Shopsog Galahad, the errant knight, etc. All of that comes from this slightly Victorian, late Victorian uh, world. Mm. That was one of the um, real discoveries reading your book was seeing how interesting it was th throughout his life for someone who's kind of in this crest of modernity in lots of professional mm. ways <laughs> to personally yet, have such um, old old fashioned, as you say, sh sort of chivalric values. Um, yeah, and and but also managed to miss some of it too. So after school. He um, he doesn't go to university, which is not uncommon. You know, it's not mm -hmm. like today where a lot of people go straight from school into university. It was not necessarily expected that you would go you would go to university, and it was more likely that someone of, of his education would, would 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 go into into the civil service, which is actually what he did. Although you know, he was certainly intelligent enough to go into go to university. He goes into the civil service, hates it, last six months of his own, in his own in words, all the time really wants to write poetry. Mm. And so this is, by this time, it, it's sort of 1907, he's in the civil service in, in 1908. In 1907, that year, I think his first poem is published. And in 1908, he's living on his own in Bloomsbury, um, this kind of you know, excitable... 20 year old uh, mm. trying to make his his name as a, as, as a poet and at the same time the beginnings of of modernism are starting to you know ferment elsewhere and and Chana is so fascinated by the the chivalric world that his some of most of his poetry is about not all but most of his poetry is kind of about an Arthurian-esque universe and he he kind of misses he, he doesn't miss, to say he misses modernism is far too strong because it wasn't really a thing there uh, but he contributes to the thi to to some of the things that modernism ends up reacting against so Raymond Chandler was writing these poems about male heroes in this Arthurian Mort D'Arthur type world and he was very much writing to a market that existed for that kind of stuff uh, mm -hmm. poetry was all about you know, fairies and legends at that time. Mm -hmm. um, that's what the newspapers and magazines that printed poetry wanted. And that's kind of what Pound and Eliot uh, were reacting against. They saw this slightly feminized version of poetry. What, what, sorry, what they thought was a feminized version of poetry. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they thought wasn't really proper poetry and you know, went on to, to write these more masculine-esque mm. uh, uh, verse. So that my cat is meowing very aggressively behind <laughs> <me>. <laughs> Is your yeah. Is your cat called Taki? He is not, but I am yeah. going to grab him for one second because I just want to show you. Leo looks mm. eerily like Taki. Oh, really? Um, my, so my, <laughs> my wife got the cat. Um, mm. And uh, when he was, he's, he's a rescue. And I showed her the picture of Taki and he looks exactly like Leo. Well, Leo looks really? exactly like Taki. <laughs> um, so he is not, he's not called Taki, but he does, there is, I'll send you a photograph another time. Yeah. Um, 
sorry, that was a weird distraction. Uh, <laughs> what was I saying? But yes, yeah, so, so Chandra is really writing in this, is, he will later come to kind of revolution, revolutionize detective fiction, but his literary career sputters and fails really by, by contributing to the stuff that modernism would end up trying to, to, to push back against. And I think that's quite mm. an interesting way to start, particularly when you think when he was writing in the 30s, he would have been very aware of what Joyce, Eliot, Pound, yeah. et cetera, had, had achieved in the, in the, the 10s and 20s. Yeah. And it really, um, it really stuck with him. That, that something I hadn't realized until I read your book was, A, how long he continued writing poetry, um, mm. I, I thought from introductions to various novels of his, I've I've read that it was something he got out of his system in his teens. For some reason, I got that impression. But also when he turns to writing uh, in in his forties, uh, I think, and he he goes on a, a course. What, what he's he's still sort of um, quite interested in a world of castles and knights. Yeah, yeah. I mean, his well, <laughs> Chandler's worldview was very much shaped by that Dulwich experience and the chivalric mm. rules that he he wanted to express. And and you see that in, in Marlowe, but you also see it in his personal life. You also see it in his fantasy life as well. Later, when after Sissy Chandler dies in, in 53, you have, you know, Chandler really goes off the rails. You, tries to kill himself mm. and drinks more and more. And at one point he was living in London and he was so drunk he would injure himself. You know, he would fall down the stairs or he would get into trouble. And he would invent these elaborate stories about how he rescued a damsel in distress, in distress with his um, masculine, you know, fists. Mm. And that kind of comes from his fascination with this world and and it just shows how much it really you know, wrapped it, its way through his consciousness i think yeah i mean he did he, he did serve in the, in the war i mean yeah. he did he did come close to some some of being a modern version of uh, um a knight i suppose could i ask a bit more about his 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 war service sure i mean his his war service is 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 complicated i think because mm. There are stories that he tells that might not be true, and there are some factual records that you know that we can trace his unit and his his battalion. You know what they did. It's not necessarily clear where where he was in all of mm. that. But what what is absolutely true is is that he signed up to fight for the Canadians in 1917 uh, before mm. America entered the war. So at this point, he's living in LA and. Uh, he has a nice life in in in, mm. in on the west coast. He is a uh, working at the LA Creamery as an accountant. He's got a set of friends, and he's living with this bohemian set called hanging out with this bohemian set called the Optimists, writing poetry and writing operas or li librettos for operas. And he 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 feels the need to go in and defend his country. Although he's an Amer it's not really his country, it's kind of complicated, so he fights for the Canadians. He trains in, in Canada, is sent to the UK and is sent to the front um, in the beginning of 1918 and probably almost certainly is on the front line for, it, for, for some periods and does face bullets and does face bombs and does face gassing and mm. ends up charging trenches. He... he, he probably had the world war experience world war one experience that that we might imagine in our head um but it's pretty short-lived he writes about being blown up that i'm i'm less sure if, if that's true it may come out at some point you know, there's always new stuff being uncovered and um, so uh, it may come out that, that that there is is strong evidence of that i just haven't found it myself but he he ends up joining the 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 uh, royal flying corps and starts uh training with them uh, in 1918, and they are the Knights of the Sky. I mean, the the, mm. the way in which they framed the air battles over the trenches were very much kind of like jousts. When the Red Baron was shot down by the British, he was given a full military funeral, and given how many men he had killed, 
you know that seems to to our modern ears odd, but but that they they kind of saw honor in their mm. battle, and that that kind of suited Chandler quite well, I think, certainly with his his own sense of self. Mm. Uh, so he joined the Royal Flying Corps, trained with them, but never never completed his training. He could fly a plane by the end of it, but basically the war wrapped up, came yeah. to an end before he managed to complete his his training. And so he was sent, he, re, he returned home. It must have been a, an horrendous experience as, uh, as, as any of us can imagine and thankfully don't have to experience. But yeah. he, he, and he doesn't really talk about it a huge amount. He does in his letters and obviously he writes a little bit about it very, very early on. I think mm-hmm. one of his, when he was doing, uh, in the 30s, when he was learning to write, he did a correspondence course and he writes um, a short story there called trench raid uh, which is about his experiences in the war that and aside from from the letters really is is it mm. um but it all the same it, it left a mark on him and in, in, it was probably during the war that he started drinking he he writes later about his royal flying corps experiences about how he spent a lot of time drunk and how he mm. didn't ever have a hangover that could be him you know, it is in that very heroic drinking mold that 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 is kind of a popular trope. So it may be him making making some of that up for a later audience, but it certainly would not be uncommon for soldiers and pilots facing the degrees of stress and experience that they had to start yeah. drinking at that period. So when um, the war wraps up and he's he's sent home how old is he and and what and, and what's he what's he doing immediately afterwards so um he would have been 30 in in 1918 and he came home and you know, home at this time being los angeles uh where he had he lived with his mother and his mother so th- this is where this is where it all gets rather uh <laughs> rather gossipy well no I was yeah. say gossipy I mean this is the yeah. sort of the, the vanity fair side of Raymond Chandler's life Chandler's mother had been living with Julian and Sissy Pascal a married couple who they had known in LA and and and, and while Chandler was fighting the war Sissy uh, sorry Florence his mum was living with this with this couple and Chandler returns and declares his love for Sissy <laughs> fairly sissy pascal fairly early on um mm. they may have been corresponding during the war it's it's not it's not really clear and um, there's no letters from that from that period that we know of but but he he gets back to the west coast and pretty quickly embarks on a on a on a courtship with of of, of sissy while she is is still married mm. now the environment in which he's living is is very uh modern and it is not an unacceptable thing in that in that group of friends for Chana to fall in love with Sissy. Um, mm. Should point out, by the way, that Sissy is about seventeen years older than him at this stage, well, yeah. throughout her life. But Sissy is an <laughs> o- a much older, a much older. Uh, well, she's an older woman, mm. and uh, so she's approaching fifty um, when 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 Chandler returns. A mutually agreed separation is is organized between sissy and julian mm. and raymond and sissy then embark on a, 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 on, a, on a courtship they don't sort of move in together or anything like that they have to be married first so that side of things goes relatively well um for all involved probably apart from julian pascal except for his mother <laughs> his mother is still pretty victorian in her outlook despite being this rebellious woman herself, having run away from her parents, she is still, she views this pretty poorly. And she views Sissy as a good friend of hers. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine, I think even today, for any mother to see her son fall in love with with someone they probably see as a close friend who is maybe close to their age, that would would be unusual even today. Mm -hmm. And she struggled with it. Um, So (laughs) Charles... is looking after himself, looking after living with his mother, also supporting Sissy, because Sissy is no longer married. Um, so he has to earn a bit more money, enters the oil industry. You know, he was very good with numbers. He worked as a uh, an accountant before the war and slightly after the war, and was you know, an 
in the twenties, LA just explodes with 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 oil. Mm. Um, not literally, but <laughs> there's oil <laughs> everywhere, and 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 money is is kind of gushing into the city. And he joins the the Dabney Corporation, I think it was called, and rises quite quickly to the top of 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 the organize of, of one of the elements of that organization because. Mm. He's a smart guy, you know, good with numbers and mm. good at you know, running offices and 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 the like. He has mm. to support two women, Florence, his mother, and Sissy, until Florence dies in 1924. And very, very quickly, he and, and Sissy marry. But he's obviously very upset. He's close to his mother, probably in, in some ways, but in other ways, she's she's a big burden. And there's some mm. suggestion in his writing that he has a very, doesn't like his mother very much, um, although nothing explicit. Mm. But then he marries someone who's close to his mother's age. It's a very odd and complicated yeah. romantic space to exist in. Uh, what, and was it odd for the time for sort of pre-war for a man of his age to be living with his mother? Was it usual to, to support one's mother like that? Um, I don't no, I, I I don't think so. Mm. Um, I don't think that that in and of itself was unusual. I think it might be viewed as a bit unfair that mm. he was given responsibility for his mother. I mean, you look at Victorian novels and 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 early twentieth century novels. M- mothers are still there with their fam with their young families yeah. um their, their their sons and daughters young families so you know the family circle is you know it, it's not like today where you know you can live on another side of the world from your parents in, in the way mm. that we do but chandler was felt very responsible for his mother and and had done for a very 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 long time i think mm. you know when he was very young trying to you know fa- failing to protect her but also you know, he he moved his mother from London to the west coast of America, which is a huge journey in in, in 1913, as, as as you can imagine, yeah. and had to look after her. It must have been difficult as a young man in his mid twenties to do that. Yeah. So, what um, what was Sissy like? What I, I know, she despite the age gap, they they went on to have a quite a long long relationship obviously had some really uh so some dark times ahead with mm. illness and and um uh Chandler's drinking and affairs but what what was it like in the in the first flush was it um was there a, an obvious spark there <laughs> it's a really interesting question it's very very difficult to know the the real the true mm. answer to that because um Chandler burnt their love letters allegedly he, oh. he says so there's no letters between the two of them so we are entirely reliant on on really his account of their relationship and some con- contemporaneous stuff as well sissy herself was fascinating julian J- raymond chandler was her third husband mm. she had married young lived in new york where she worked as a model and may or may not have been involved in uh, you know some racy stuff as as Chandler you know would tell everyone. Um, um, she 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 married Julian Pascal and they were they ended up in he was a, a composer um, and so they ended up in on the west coast. So she moved from the from the east to the west coast where she set up this life. Met Ray, separated from Julian and divorced Julian and then and then ended up uh, with her husband seventeen years her her junior. Chandler always claimed they had a very racy sex life. I find that hard to believe, if, if I'm honest. Um, he had a very complicated view of women and sex. And I just I just find it hard to believe that he was in any way racy. I mean, Sissy might have been, but um, I yeah. find it hard to believe he was. It is likely that she was his first sexual experience as well so he it wasn't like he 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 had a lot of uh, uh, to go on either so sissy becomes this kind of very caring and supportive woman helping you know look after the home but also something of a burden as well at at a period i mean in the 20s when chana's working 
in the oil industry, he has at least one affair and mm. is thrown out of uh, the house and has to sort of restart their relationship. And yeah. at this time, his you know his drinking really is is out of hand. Uh, he ends up losing his job because he wasn't showing up to the office and he was going off with secretaries and he was doing all sorts of of awful things. And Sissy sticks with him, which is extraordinary. Mm. Um, she forgives him and they basically retreat into their own little unit. Moving around mm. Los Angeles, this is in the in the very late 20s and early and throughout the 30s, and become just quite cut off from 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 the world i th- i think there's not a huge amount of evidence yeah. of, of friends at the time there, there there are some but they they are very mutually supportive of one another at that time you know he focuses on his writing and is able to to make a living doing something he's always wanted to do which is to write books um by joining by 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 writing for the pulps which he initially sees as a as a means to an end, as a way he, he says something mm-hmm. like, I get to learn to write and get paid while I do it. And he believes yeah. he can make a living as as a as a pulp writer. Mm. At some point he says, he talks about living only on soup um during this period. Not there's not a huge amount of evidence for that, uh, other than what he yeah. says. They seem to have had a relatively small but steady income from the best I I I could find. But Sissy is very tolerant of, of of his of his dreams and supportive supportive of them, and then when when we get to 1939, so Chan has just published The Big Sleep. You know, he's not any any sense a success. You know, The Big Sleep didn't sell t- terribly well until the paperback came out, but he's achieved this kind of a major ambition in life, which is to publish a novel. He sits down and he writes in his diary this plan, um, which sketches out two books, two further Marlowe, three further Marlowe no- novels. And then he wants to do something different. He wants to move on. And Sissy writes this note. So she would she would type up some of his scribbles and put them in the notebook. No, it wasn't really a notebook um, that he had, by the way. It wasn't like a notebook in the sense that you and I might think of bound paper. It was more like a filofax. If you re- do you know what a filofax is? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you look too young. <laughs> but filofax is <laughs> and for, for for listeners who are similarly youthful are like binders, like very small binders, mm. and you would clip in the notes. And that's kind of what Raymond Chandler had, like an early fire fact. And so she, he would scribble these things out and she would sometimes type them up and um, she would also write on these notes. And, 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 and so on this plan that exists in the file facts, she wrote um, something like Dear Ramio, which was her pet name for him, suggesting this kind of very kind of sweet romantic relationship. One day you will look back on this and smile at these dreams, something like that, um, full yeah. stop, or maybe you won't. And that's very <laughs> ominous. And actually yeah. kind of what happens. It, it's it's yeah. but it, it, she. So I think she understood her husband very, very well. Um, yeah, that was a real jolt uh, reading your, your book when that, that, mm. uh, that moment happens because she's such an enigmatic figure and then that's the I, I, I didn't um, catch on to the fact that he'd, he'd burnt so much correspondence between them so obviously there's little to go on and that's the first time you sort of hear this uh, this person's voice yeah she, she she's she's sadly silent and maybe somewhere there's a bundle of letters that he didn't burn mm. and someone will turn them up I don't know but we just don't know yeah um so he's he is a a late starter in in more ways than one. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he uh, he has all these various jobs before getting uh, to writing, and uh, um, as you've explained, he starts off in the in the pulps. Was there much indication that he was interested in writing non poetry or, or prose um, before then? It's a good question. Um, I don't think he ever stopped wanting to write. So, so he has this kind of this formative literary career that doesn't go very well in London in mm. the in the uh, you know between 1907 and, and 1912. He moves over to the West Coast and you know he still writes poetry. He still he still writes something. When he signs up for the Canadians um, on his attestation paper, he lists his job as journalist. So he clearly thought of himself as excuse me as a writer. 
even though he hadn't done any, he hadn't tried to publish anything, as far as we know, mm. when he listed himself in the phone book in the early 30s, he also listed himself as a writer. I think that, I think it was a, you know, so many people, it was a, it was a long burning ambition in him. Yeah. And he found himself career wise at a dead end. Also, it's very easy to forget the Great Depression is 1928. You know, there is not, the economy is struggling. He is trying to get off alcohol and he, you know, to a certain extent, he's probably successful. He probably goes pretty dry during this period, but there isn't necessarily a huge amount of, of opportunity for, for, for people, um, you know, in the business world. So he doesn't necessarily have an obvious job. Yeah. Um, so he, he goes back to the thing that he's always wanted to do, which is right. And Sean is always very strategic, I think. When he was a poet, he was writing very much to the kind of, the kind of poetry that magazines and newspapers wanted to, to publish. Mm. He looked at the books market, and I, I think he saw an opportunity in the pulp fiction market that he recognized was a good one and something he felt he could do. Um, mm. I don't think there was ever, certainly no burning ambition to be a crime novelist. What he really wanted to be was a, was a novelist, and he saw in the pulps this wonderful chance to write and get paid. And mm. he's even, he, he says to friends in the early 30s, or one friend at least, you will not believe what I'm doing. You know, me with all my um, literary and poetic sensibilities, here I am writing for the pulps. Um, <laughs> and there's a kind of sense of disbelief that he's going to go and do these things. And yet... Yeah. He does. He doesn't just do it. He does it incredibly well. I mean, his first story is on the cover of Black Mask, which is a, a, a huge, a huge achievement. Admittedly, it takes him something like a year to write. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And to, to be good at this, you have to, like, to make real money from the pulps, you had to churn out words. I mean, the, the people who were making good money from it were, were writing something like a million words a year. Yeah, I struggle with a thousand words, a, <laughs> you know, a, a week, a million words a year. Yeah. It's just unimaginable. But that's how you make cash. He 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 saw he found that the pulps were a good way of like, of, of, of basically to a certain extent experimenting um, mm. with some ideas. But it got him going, and it gave him the confidence to write a novel. And it also yeah. gave him a lot of material. I mean, almost all of his novels that come afterwards, you know, the big sleep. I think it's only fail my lovely and the high window that are entirely original um, and don't have a short story somewhere in the background or in playback, which is his um, final novel, mm. um, final completed novel. That was a, a screenplay originally. I, fi I find it so interesting, this this combination in, in Chandler of the highbrow, slightly Victorian sounding poet writer <laughs> and the rough and ready, hard-boiled man of action, um, <laughs> and and you know, hardworking as you say, like, industrious, mm. yeah. Um, and and the sort of the 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 interplay just within himself of of occasionally sort of loathing either side, and um, he, occasionally just finding such in incredible success in it, at it he, as well. He took the act of learning to write and writing incredibly seriously. He mm. would deconstruct other people's short stories. Earl Stanley Gardner's was 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 a really good example. He he would take a story that Earl Stanley Gardner, who was the Perry, author of the Perry Mason stories, take a story and write synopses after synopsis of it, and then write his own version until he felt like he'd learned how the story worked. It's a very laborious task to do yeah. that, and sort you, of ruthlessly commonsensical as well. Absolutely, absolutely. It's totally demystifying when it comes to writing, where so many people are inclined to be, you know, you've just got to let it come to you. You've just got to, <laughs> no, no, just take it apart like a car. Absolutely. And he gave some, what I, what I, I think is probably the, the best advice about any kind of hard work, but it's, it's very specific to writing, which is, I mean, I'm paraphrasing because um, he puts it much, much better than I will, but he says something like, the best thing to do if you're a writer is to put yourself in a shed with nothing else but a typewriter. And eventually you'll get so bored that all the only way of alleviating your boredom is to write. And then <laughs> magic will happen. 
and <laughs> and I you know I think that's absolutely true it's incredibly difficult yeah. in 2020 to stick <laughs> to that regimen but you know there are a lot of books at the moment about how to do distraction free how to be yeah. you know, manage your digital um life just need a shed and a typewriter <laughs> exactly and we would all yeah. be fine <laughs> yeah um so how did he, he he's such an uh, unconventional figure for the for the for reasons um you've mentioned how did he get on with other pulp writers either when he met them or just as he as he read them it's an interesting question he so, so the the did the, there's some open questions about how many pulp writers he actually met mm. he did meet some but his, what, what Chandler really was good at is letter writing. One of the, the sad things about Raymond Chandler is, is that the Raymond Chandler publication history is that his novels are marvellous, but his letters are also equally marvellous and they're much harder to get hold of um, in 2020 um, than, his, than his novels. Mm. But so he would spend a lot of time writing to, say, Earl Stanley Gardner, so who became a very big correspondent early on. Later on, uh, other writers, and he he would he actually preferred writing to to one of his closest friends was Hamish Hamilton, the the publisher of of Hamish Hamilton, which is now part of uh, Penguin Random House, and their relationship was entirely based on letter. They actually met very very later on, but much much later on, they just enjoyed it, these kind of like long exchanges of, of letters, which took weeks to kind of move across the Atlantic as well. Yeah, so. I think there was there, there is a famous dinner that he, there's a picture of him sitting somewhere near Dash or Hammett at a dinner, but whether they actually exchanged, I mean, it's a bit like I think Joyce and Proust were at a dinner at the Majestic and one night, um, and no one really knows whether they actually spoke to one another. Yeah. Um, but there's a hundred novels imagining that they did. Maybe, maybe yeah. some. I'm sure there are a similar number of novels about the the maybe meeting of of, of Hammett and Chandler. Chandler was basically a grumpy old man, and didn't always like meeting people. He didn't like meeting people who weren't going to kind of admire him greatly. And so he preferred letter writing. He, mm. he became much more sociable when he worked in Hollywood because Hollywood had, had the writer's room and there was always a drinks cabinet in the corner and you would go in and there were a lot of younger colleagues who were, you know, he was this, this older guy dressed in tweed, you know, not necessarily the person who fitted in. It's obviously with these young writer types and and i think they were much more they were very admiring of him and so he liked talking to them but generally he was a bit of a a bit of a kept himself to himself and just preferred to you know spew out letters yeah so as as you mentioned he he it took a while for for people to consider him as well to make him a success mm. did it, it was it with the paperback publication of big sleep that sort of made his name that was definitely that was definitely something i mean kind of paperback fiction also does very well during the war mm. um because you know soldiers wanted something to distract them and and you know paperbacks were small and could you know fit in pockets so his name really does does grow then and, and his reputation does it kind of depends on what we mean by success right what you know what, what does success look like for raymond chandler he was never as admired in the United States as he was in the United Kingdom. Yeah. So in the United Kingdom, he was seen as a, a, as, as a major talent, admired by all sorts of writers, um, but Auden was a big fan yeah. and wrote about him in, 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 in various times. When he, he went to London, he was fetid. He went to London towards the end of his, his well, certainly the very end of Sissy's life and also towards the end of his life in the 50s, but he was fetid in London. Um, in America, he was respected, I think, and admired, but he wasn't, and you know, still isn't, I don't think, seen as in, in quite the same way as this kind of literary crime writer in the yeah. same way as, as as he is in the UK. You know, in the sense of of how his books were received, um, I'm not sure in the US. I'm not sure he ever enjoyed the success he would have liked. Certainly in the UK, mm. by the time things like the big, uh, not the big sleep. Sorry. By the time uh, the long goodbye came out, he was being reviewed in all the major places, all the major kind of presses, as a more literary writer, and not being you know, stuck in the crime fiction start, crime fiction yeah. section. In America, he never really made it out of that part. Um, financially, it was films and movies really that made 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 the made him money. Yeah. Um, so if you just see it purely as you know what made Raymond Chandler a financial success, 
it was writing Dublin Demnity and then being on contract at studios. There's a great story about about Dublin Demnity and, and 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 money. So he was a he was kind of approached out of the blue to write Dublin Demnity. It had been a, the rights had been acquired by the studio, and it was seen as as very very difficult to adapt because mm. it was too obviously sexy, and you know you couldn't have you couldn't depict uh, at the time the kind of sexual frisson that is important to the novel on the screen, mm. and uh, the producers were determined to do it, and it was one of the producers was a fan of Raymond Chandler um, and wrote to him and said, look, basically got in touch with his, fire his agent and said, would you be interested in doing this? And he goes up to meet Billy Wilder, who is the, the director. They said, he basically says, I can write your screenplay. Um, it'll take me two weeks. Uh, and five, you know, your fee of $500 will be fantastic. And they looked at him and went, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not how this works. You know, we will get, it'll, it'll take, you know, 12 weeks, 13 weeks, whatever it will take you, it'll take you as long as it takes you, and we'll pay you $500 a week to do this. And so he, you know, this really transformed his fortunes from being a sort of a novelist with some income to being a relatively wealthy man. Mm. Um, and then as, you know, on the back of Dublin Indemnity, he got more and more film work, more and more studio work, uh, and commanded higher and higher fees. Um, yeah. Even though he never really had another great success <laughs> with, uh, with 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 his screenwriting, there's some. I, I don't want to spoil them all, so people people should get the book. But there's some fantastic anecdotes about his time in Hollywood, <laughs> his, his disdain for it. That I laughed out loud at the uh, the bust up with Hitchcock. Um, mm. Uh, there's a fantastic parting shot from from, <laughs> from Chandler in that. What, yeah. What were his feelings about uh, um, sort of script writing as a as a form? Um, like, did he have respect for cinema, or did he consider this money work? So he loved he he loved the cinema. So mm -hmm. before independent of of, of Dublin Demnity, he and Sissy were big cinema goers, and it makes sense. They lived in LA. There's a cinema. Yeah on every street corner. So, so they, were, they were going to the cinema a lot. And then when the opportunity, certainly, certainly Raymond Chandler didn't understand what it was to write a screenplay when it was Charles Brackett, not John Houseman, by the way, who approached mm. him. Charles Brackett and Billy Wilder were the, the pair making um, Dublin Indemnity. When they approached him to do Dublin Indemnity, he didn't really know what, you know, what writing a screenplay was. Mm. But he, he, he would later say that if Shakespeare were alive in the, in the 40s and 50s, he would be writing for Hollywood. Mm. And I think that shows the, the way in which Chana came to view cinema. It was a exciting new, well, it wasn't that new, but it was, for him, it was an exciting new way to explore the things that he liked to do, which are character and an and atmosphere. Um, and he could use words and dialogue really well to do that. And, and actually, you, know, you, you, you just have to look at, at Dublin Indemnity, I think, to see how he managed to, to create character and to create atmosphere through, through dialogue mm -hmm. alone. And Billy Wilder was the director and, and, and you know, shares screenwriting credit I th my understanding is I, I think that, that Chandler wrote most of the words, but obviously the filmmaking process is, is, is really, really difficult to, to kind of attribute creative source to. Mm -hmm. But you look at that Dublin Indemnity script and the way in which he managed, is, he, that, that, that that script manages to imply erotic tension without there being erotic <laughs> tension in the words itself is extraordinary. Mm. And that's how it got, they managed to kind of slip it under the radar. When you watch it today, the exchange between Walter Neff and um, trying to remember the, uh, Dietrich the main it, woman's name. Dietrichson? Yeah, Phyllis. yes, you're right, you're right. Phyllis Dietrichson. So when, when they meet and there's that, I'm going to paraphrase, but they talk about the, you know, you're speeding 
um, it's a you know only a 30 mile an hour zone in this area or whatever I, I'm doing this very badly but you know that crackles with sexual tension mm. in the film um, but the words on, pay, on the page don't really imply mm. that um, and so that kind of got got under the uh, it's not exactly censors but the people who the, the the people who were sort of giving the stamp of approval for 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 a movie to be to be made um, it slipped under their radar that way. And when you think about it, that's exactly what Chandler want, is trying to do with his novels as well. He's trying to use language to, to create character and atmosphere. And so film becomes a, a, a kind of another way to do it. And admittedly, a, a sort of much better paid one. Um, there may also be something in the appeal of, of, of film in that often he was working with other people's material. Yeah. So he does. He does write two original movies, which are um, the Blue Dahlia and and, and Playback. Mm. But for much of his work, um, he's rewriting either other people's dialogue from you know, editing other people's scripts or rewriting other people's scripts, or at least adaptating other people's fiction. Mm. And there may be something in that. You know, as he was drinking a bit a lot more during this period in his life, he may have been struggling to be as creative as he once was, although that, that is, is kind of wild speculation on, on, on my part, I think. But he, he came to respect and, and enjoy the act of film writing, I think. Maybe enjoy is too strong. He, he found it hard. Yeah. But just like his fiction and his short stories, it was a long, slow process. Mm. You know, he, he, he likes to write. I think he, he talks about write, when he's writing the big, uh, uh, when he's writing playback, which was an extraordinary deal. You know, he got huge amount of money um he got to retain almost all of the rights and he got to basically do whatever he wanted without the interference of a studio mm. and ended up writing a, a screenplay that was probably too expensive to to well it never got made because it was it was it was too expensive yeah but he talks about using a camel hair brush when 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 writing that that screenplay and and he was doing it very precisely and that a bit like the pulp industry I think screenplays relied on quite a lot of you know churn really you know people turning over screenplays quite quickly so he he he, he I think he found that hard yeah and one of whilst he he did get he, he was good at writing screenplays to a certain extent the thing that he struggled with the most was not having complete control over the the end product mm. um, it's why he had this great difficulty with um, with Hitchcock because Hitchcock was was Alfred Hitchcock. He he just needed someone to kind of put a few words on a page. Yeah. And then Hitchcock was going to do the rest. Whereas Chandler thought at the time it should be the other way around and that you know his his vision for a novel um because he was adapting the Patricia Highsmith novel Strangers on the Train, he thought it should be the writer's vision, Raymond Chandler's vision that was brought to screen and, and obviously Alfred Hitchcock was never going to go go with that. Mm. So like all of Raymond Chandler's kind of um, experience it's kind of complicated it, you know he 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 became very wealthy yeah writing for hollywood uh i think he liked the discipline and he found the medium fascinating mm. but the his output in hollywood is is you know pretty mixed and starts off well and doesn't necessarily ever achieve the same greatness as he did with double indemnity yeah um the Blue Dahlia. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's an okay film. I really want to uh, now, having not... read having read your book, <laughs> because the, the, w- there was one thing that it's funny you mentioned the the quote about you know if Shakespeare was around he'd be writing for Hollywood because um, you mentioned that uh, Chandler was up against censorship rather like mm. Shakespeare was. Um, yeah, but that there's a fascinating reference t- w- during the making of the Blue Dahlia uh, where the the intended murderer that Chandler has been writing his scripts around, the 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 person who's going to turn out to be the killer, gets he, where he gets told he can't make it that that person because he's is, is he an ex Navy veteran and the U.S. Navy yeah say no you can't exactly. do that. How on earth I was, <laughs> I was going to ask you <laughs> how on earth did the U.S. Navy? I can understand why they wouldn't want that, but how did they get wind of it and and how did they control that? Well. Uh, it's not that big a surprise, I guess, when you when you think when you consider when it's being written, which is in the in the mid forties. Yeah. And so there was a lot more caution 
around what could and couldn't be said about the military then. Mm. And military censors would you know, get involved. Right. Um, and the war, you know, it's, it's, it's being written in 45. So, so the war is still going on at the time. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's a huge shock they were making all sorts of propaganda films at the time as well, you know, trying to get people to to, to sign up and yeah. for the war. So, so they wouldn't have wanted, um, <laughs> you know, the soldier or the the the, the navy guy being the murderer. The, the murderer. <laughs> um, but it did throw Chandler for a loop. Yeah, and there is a lot of a, a lot of stuff. And the Blue Dahlia, the writing of the Blue Dahlia is is famous more for how it became came to be written in the end as much as the movie itself mm. because Chandler after he was told look you can't have your murderer he had to go away and come up with a new murderer and this is while the film is being shot so he said okay I'll do it but you know you've got a I'm the only way I can do this is if I get totally and utterly drunk and look, I'm a bit of an old man and my wife's an older woman. So you're going to have to make sure there's doctors on duty for both of us. Uh, I want a sec- I want 24-hour secretaries. And so, uh, and I, I'm just going to get sozzled. And what he would do is get drunk, pass out, wake up, dictate bits of the screenplays to the secretary, pass out again, drink, Gosh. wake up, drink, etc. And this, this, you know, and there, there were... There were it's the most extraordinary environment in which to write a, a, a film. Mm. Um, and he, he, he somehow convinced studio bosses that this was the only way it would get finished. And, and it did. Yeah. Um, but it was, you know, now I guess people, I, I think people know the movie for that story as much as any reason. I, I, it never seems to be in the kind of the, the great lists of noir movies, unfortunately. No, I mean, obviously, but now it, um, we've re- referenced a couple of times, there is this enormous alcohol problem sort of <laughs> shadowing his life, um, his whole life, yeah. but uh, p- worsening and worsening as time goes on, and especially once his wife dies. Um, that seems mm-hmm. to be a sort of end of the peer moment. What, before we just sort of get into the, the sort of end of his life, did he ever return to his... Because we, we, when we, f- fans of Chandler... Uh, look at his novels mm. we see in exclusively philip marlowe dominated uh canon but he writes um and, and, and you quote him throughout his life talking about oh i'll guess i guess i'll call in marlowe again um instead of <laughs> writing this project or instead of writing that project he never seems to you know have in mind an exclusive uh writer character relationship with marlowe at what point do you think he gave up on that serious English novel that he sometimes spoke about? I think I think he did have very early on. He did plan on on writing three Marlowe novels, mm. and they were going to be the Big Sleep, Foe on My Lovely, and then either The Lady in the the Lake or 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 High Window. And he he struggled. He managed to to the Big Sleep was the Big Sleep, and Foe on My Lovely was Foe on My Lovely, and he struggled between High Window. And Lady in the Lake. And actually, he starts writing Lady in the Lake first and puts it on pause and goes to High Window and then back. He kind of moves back and forward. But those are very much, those novels were kind of part of the Marlowe, the Marlowe plan, I think. Mm. And then he gets involved in Hollywood and then he comes back and writes The Little Sister, which is also kind of a bit of an answer to Hollywood. It's very critical of, 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 of Hollywood. Yeah. But throughout this, I mean, as you said, he's always wanting to write his serious. I, mean, I put serious in, in, in inverted commas in some ways because I'm not really sure what a serious novel is. Yeah, no, um, and he hated that, actually, that reference to it, didn't he? That when people it, it, said, it, it, oh, when is Chandler going to write a serious novel? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And and um, I know you're a J.B. Priestley fan and, and there's a moment <laughs> where J.B. Priestley <laughs> really upset Raymond Chandler by saying something like that. But yeah. we'll, come, we'll come to that. In 1950... 52 between 1950 52 he's writing what will become the long goodbye Mm. and originally the long goodbye was written in the third person and Marlowe wasn't in it and he Raymond Chandler claims to have written two-thirds of this book and abandoned it Mm. and I think that manuscript doesn't exist and it you know or it's never been found it'd be wonderful if, if if there's a trunk somewhere in some uh, attic with this manuscript in so yeah. one would be amazing to understand it but but that for me i think is 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 the moment in which or the the, the point at which shana's kind of 
dreams start to drift away. Mm. The Long Goodbye is, in many ways, I mean, it's barely a murder story. All of the, the murders happen off stage. Don't think Philip Marlowe even sees a body. Yeah. It is much more about his relationship with Terry Lennox. Mm. Uh, 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 and there is a version of, there is a basic, there is a version of that in Raymond Chandler's head um, that didn't feature Philip Marlowe, but that he couldn't deliver. Mm. You know, he couldn't make work. And that's when, when he abandons that and, and rewrites it as a Marlowe novel, that's really when... Uh, I think he realizes too that he's missed his opportunity mm. and he will come back to, to a novel he imagined called, called, called English Summer. He will come back to it after, in, 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 after 1953 when The Long Goodbye is published. Mm. But by this time, Sissy has passed away. Chandler is spiraling downwards as an alcoholic and, and it's an idea and there is a version of it that exists. I mean, there is a, a published it's not a novel, but it's like a, it's an extended short story that exists called English Summer, but it, it's not really, it's certainly not the novel that Chana really wanted to write. Yeah. And so Marlowe becomes this, Marlowe is a kind of creative crutch, I think, for Roman Chanda. It's the only way in which he can get his, his stuff out. Mm. And, and in some ways that's the, the, tragedy is too strong a word, but that's the sadness of, of, of Roman Chanda's life, I think. And certainly how he, saw it there is a there is a poem that he writes at the very end of his life which i am going to read four lines from that's all right please do the seasons change the better things endure yet what was vibrant now is dim and slow oh that the brilliance were mine to create but all the golden thoughts arrived too late and i think that's that for me that for charmer summed him, himself up slightly is it was mm his golden thoughts came a little bit too late and that's sad really really sad he i mean the, your the final few chapters of your biography and of his life are incredibly sad he becomes a increasingly sort of baffling figure to people around him and pe- there are people who make every effort to um to help him but he's he's a bit sort of beyond help it seems um yeah sissy throughout his life throughout their life together was was something of an, what we would call today an enabler mm. you know enabled his drinking she enabled his drinking um she she kind of gave tacit permission for it mm. um and he was always a, a heavy drinker with various periods of abstinence but towards the end of his life I mean, he after sissy died he tried to kill himself and then he didn't succeed but just kind of dropped over the edge and spiraled further and further into sort of drunkenness moving between london and 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 the west coast Mm. um with various kind of women around him help trying to help him Mm. to to a greater or lesser extent there is for raymond chandler in periods of his life alcohol brought great creativity yeah the obvious example being you know in his in his mind the blue dahlia helped him helped him write the blue dahlia but it also, you know, was a very limiting thing as well and just trapped him in some ways in, in, in this world. He couldn't quite escape. The Long Goodbye being a, a good example. You know, he, he wrote Playback after, in that, which was published in 1957. Mm. And generally that's seen as, as the weakest. It's a very short, short novel. It's generally seen as his weakest version. It's actually, Playback was a, a movie he wrote at the beginning of the fifties, the one that he got, he got a huge amount of money for and create complete creative control over. And he adapted that as a Philip Marlowe story <laughs> because that's all he could really do. And I, I yeah, that period of, of just drinking and, and sadness and, yeah. you know, is, is, is horrendous. It is a, it's a bewildering sort of dislocated um, end. And, but he, he comes across such a, a, an interesting mix of people. Um, Natasha Spender, uh, Christopher Isherwood, and um, yeah, JB Priestley, who I I did want to ask about. It was a, it was I was so surprised to see see him uh, turn up. With, started by saying worlds collide. That felt like one. Well. It was like <laughs> it was like seeing Alan Bennett hanging out with Ernest Hemingway or something. <laughs> it was like what are these two wow. doing here? Um, I, that that's a great kind of COVID 
talking head play, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, what would <laughs> what would Alan Bennett say to? Maybe I mean Alan Bennett's alive, so you could ask yeah. him. But um, what would he say to, to Ernest Hemingway? But no, I think the one thing that's I find hard to think about around about the fifties is just how much smaller the literary world was. Yeah. So there are a few books published in the fifties, and there are now, and it is a lot more uh, elitist I mean I, I you know publishing is still incredibly elitist and yeah and that's a whole mm. <laughs> whole other problem I wouldn't want to suggest otherwise um, but it was even more so in, in 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 the 50s and so the connections between people were it was much easier to enter that world mm. because a circle existed you know uh, multiple circles existed obviously but 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 you know, Raymond Chandler was was a correspondent with Hamish Hamilton. Hamish Hamilton introduced him to the Spenders. The Spenders introduced him to uh, Isherwood, and 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 you know he goes to dinner with um, with George Orwell's widow. You know, this is all happening, but, but because you know Hamish Hamilton is kind of at, at the centre of this literary world, and London is at the centre of this literary world as well. Mm. You know, we should you know should shouldn't shouldn't forget. J. B. Priestley is a, another Hamish Hamilton. Uh, connection <laughs> and I, I I'm sure you um know a lot more about J.B. Priestley than I do um so correct me if I'm wrong um, about any of this but my understanding is basically in the in the early 50s he had been kicked out of his of his house by his wife and um, for having an affair and basically ran off to America oh right. I actually and... don't know much about his life basically I I, ah. I grew up in Yorkshire where you can't really move right. for an adaptation of an <laughs> inspector called being put on yeah but but for that reason I just I I associate him so strongly with a, a fairly small small world and I haven't really heard him in, in in connection with much more of a other than a you know he's the writer from the north um, I don't haven't heard right. him much in connection. The one. Exactly, the... yeah. A bit like Alan Bennett, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, yeah. So I don't know much about his biography, right? Or how he ended up in America. Um, well, he was he was running away. I mean, he mm. basically was was he basically had an affair. As, as I understand, he had an affair. Um, his wife said, "You know, go away for for a little while." <laughs> he ends up in uh, Tijuana, uh, <laughs> which <laughs> I have no idea. I and mean, Tijuana is a border town. It's sort of um, was full of um, you know people of ne- negotiable affection mm. uh, and and drugs and alcohol and stuff, and um, <laughs> he cables Raymond Chandler, who he doesn't know. Yeah. The only thing is, is that Hamish Hamilton knows them both and has written to Raymond Chandler saying you got and and Jamie Priest at some point said you chaps should meet, and um, he cables Raymond Chandler. Raymond Chandler gets in his car, drives down to Tijuana from uh, from uh, La Jolla. And uh, which is just north of San, uh, San Diego, mm. and um, picks up J.B. Priestley, and they drive back. And it was a couple of hours drive, I think, maybe three hours, something like that. You know, in, in one of these, you know, it's not a short journey, I should say. And J.B. Priestley, who is very chatty, apparently, just kind of you know garrulous, keeps on talking. <laughs> very early on in this car journey, turns around and says, "Yes, I, lo- I like your books. You know, you should try doing something without a murder in it." Um, and Raymond Chandler is. Yeah, you know, as we've discussed, is is always wanted to do a novel without murder, and is always wanted to do a you know a inverted commas serious novel. Yeah, um, is really quite upset by this, and so they had this very uncomfortable long journey back up to La Jolla, where Charlie then leaves him in a hotel, brings him home to introduce his wife and to various friends, and gives him the kind of literary tour of the area. Mm. But really, they just they don't become bosom buddies. I don't think. Um, he he quite I think he says to Hamish Hamilton he's a he's a that JB Priestley was a was a nice guy yeah but I don't think they became <laughs> they certainly yeah they didn't become great friends and I think the whole experience was pretty pretty difficult for for Chandler yeah so it sounds like a sort of arranged <laughs> it sounds like someone someone <laughs> your parents ask you to hang out with <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly I mean it's like picking up your your, your distant cousin who you've met once at a party and having to, you know, stick up with, for, uh, put up in your in your home for a few days. I'm yeah. not the trying to actually put them up, but that must be a, a real, a real difficult thing, especially if you're, you know, introverted uh, in the way that Raymond Chandler was. Mm-hmm. 
In America, a thriller of mystery story writer, as we call them, is slightly below the salt. Well, uh, the thriller writer, he has very below the salt, really. Uh, you can write a very lousy, long, historical novel full of sex and it can be a bestseller and can be treated respectfully. Yeah. But the, a very good thriller writer who writes far, far better gets a little paragraph at yeah, all. Yeah, I know, that's true. Mostly. Yeah. There's no attempt to judge him as a writer. And that is all we have time for for today, I'm afraid. Big thank you once again to Tom Williams. Make sure you get yourself a copy of his book, A Mysterious Something in the Light. The link is in the episode box below. And tune in again tomorrow to hear more about Tom's experience writing the book. If you'd like to get in touch with Tom, you can do so on Twitter. His handle is twilliams 81 and if you'd like to get in touch with me, you can email me at eerythis at gmail.com or search eerythis on all the usual social medias. And if you'd like to support the podcast as well as access exclusive episodes, including a run of episodes on Chandler's novels, you can do so by visiting patreon.com slash eerythis. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time, happy reading. Happy reading.